I'd now like to introduce Glenn Edwards. Glenn's from the Northern Territory Government. Um, he's in the Department of Land Ro Resource Management. Glenn's been involved with the feral camel issue from the very start, with the recognition of increasing impacts in the 2000s, leading to the DKCRC, and then pro research project, and then the ultimately involvement in this particular project. Glenn. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Um, Tom gave a nice introduction to my talk, uh, which is really a, a, a precursor talk for the day, um, which will go over some of the, uh, the early science uh, which preceded the current project. So what I'm going to do today is uh, introduce you to uh, camels and where they came from. Uh, then talk about um, the, uh, the body of evidence that um, w was built up over a number of years but suggested that camel, feral camels actually presented uh, a problem for us going, uh, going forward. I'll talk about some of the early research and survey work. Uh, then I'll talk about the first national workshop that we had uh, in 2005. Uh, then I'll finish up with a quite in-depth uh, look at the outcomes of the project that was mentioned previously, um, which... Um, I worked with um, through the Desert Knowledge CRC. All right, feral camels not native to Australia. Um, they were imported into the country as beasts of burden for transport and so on um, over the period 1840 to 1907. The domestic population peaked in about 1922. Uh, the size of that population at that time is unknown. Um, the feral camels really became established in the wild in Australia post about 1920 um, when uh, mechanised transport uh, began to increase throughout Australia, um, motor vehicles and also when the railways was pushed through th from Udnadatta to Alice Springs. So feral camels have been out there for a long time. Um, And, uh, but it wasn't until um, <coughs> much later on, uh, in, the, in the 1980s, uh, 90s in particular, that uh, people started to have a look at what might be happening with the feral camel population. Um, there was some uh, very early nice research work uh, done by uh, two Germans, Dorgas and Hukey, um, through the 1990s. Um, they had a close look at the impacts that uh, camels were having on native vegetation. And um, it was really the first insights into the fact that um, feral camels can actually cause problems for some of our uh, native species, particularly the ice cream plants, which they love to eat. Um, they also looked at the, um, the, the stocking rates that, um, at which camels could be kept um, and the correlation with that camel density to the impact on native vegetation. There was also some uh, early work done in the late 80s and going into the 1990s looking at the movements of camels by putting satellite collars on them. And um, the image uh, over there on the lower right um, shows you the size of the animals, that, uh, the size of the areas that camels can actually move over um, in re reference to the Northern Territory. So they're very mobile um, animals and they do get around. There were some early attempts um, to look at the number of feral camels that were out there. Um, going back to uh, 1969 with Tom McKnight who, who did a, a questionnaire survey. Um, there were also some attempts to uh, aerial survey feral camel numbers uh, through the 80s and going into the uh, 1990s uh, and uh, up to 2001. And it's interesting that the Northern Territory uh, ended up having the best record of uh, ca feral camel numbers um, over a period of about uh, you know, uh, 15 years of formal aerial survey, um, as well as the uh, early McKnight um, work that preceded that. And the graph I've got down the bottom here is the Northern Territory data, um, which uh, we put this out in 2001, which basically told us that in the Northern Territory, the camel population had been increasing um, in, in recent times at an exponential rate. Um, so there were a lot of camels out there and the numbers were increasing. So realising that we might have a problem, um, we obtained some uh, funding through the federal government to hold uh, the first national workshop on feral camels in 2005. And uh, I remember there was a lot of debate at that workshop about a, how many camels there might be out there and whether they actually were causing any problems. What was realised that was that if we were going to manage and manage them, we had to have uh, a national approach to doing so, a coordinated approach. 
Uh, the next year, um, the Desert Knowledge CRC was successful in getting uh, some funding to um, do some research on feral camels. And uh, the aims of that research were to uh, do a number of things, to clarify the distribution abundance movements and popula population dynamics of camels as best we could, to clarify the key stakeholder perceptions about camels, what the people on the land thought, evaluate the impacts of feral camels as uh, they were understood to be at that time, review the options which might be out there available for managing camels, and finally to make some management recommendations. What I'm going to do today is not really talk about any methods in great detail that we used with this research, but rather talk about some of the outcomes. So the, some of the key findings that came out of that research uh, in terms of population dynamics for camels were that camels occupy a very large area, which is shown on, on the, uh, the figure there at the bottom. It's a, just over 3 million square kilometres. The population estimate for the time, uh, which we arrived at using a number of techniques, but uh, the one we settled on was looking uh, at, at the more recent aerial survey data and then doing some modelling. Um, and we'll hear a bit more about some more recent modelling later today. Um, we estimated that there, there, were, there could be as many as 950,000 camels around in 2008. We also ascertained that camels occurred across a range of land tenures, including Aboriginal land, pastoral land, conservation land, and also crown land. And as I said earlier, the population uh, was certainly increasing on, based on the Northern Territory data and doubling about every nine years, at least up until 2008. In terms of landholder perceptions about feral camels, so those people with camels or dealing with camels on a day-to-day -day basis, two of the key stakeholder groups are the pastoral industry and uh, conservation land managers. Conservation people tend to see camels as a pest, whereas pastoral people tend to see camels both as a pest and potentially a resource. About 84% of pastoral properties that we surveyed engaged in some form of management back in 2008, and that management was primarily culling camels from the ground. It was limited commercial harvest of camels, so mustering camels and selling them off for meat and other products. Some camels were being used for woody weed control, particularly in Queensland. Aboriginal stakeholders. Um, cullings uh, was actually seen by this group as wasteful, um, but there were certainly concerns over camel impacts over a lot of the Aboriginal lands back in 2008. Many Aboriginal people living in remote areas saw camels as jobs. And that's very important. Camel meat was not widely utilised. Uh, little man management was undertaken on Aboriginal land at that time. There was some um, limited fencing of water holes, also a lim limited commercial harvest uh, as well, which was also occurring on the pastoral lands. Um, just on um, that point, the Northern Territory Government actually had um, looked at uh, trying to establish a commercial camel industry in Central Australia um, through the 1990s going into the 2000s. Um, but at the end of, uh, I guess, about 10 or 15 years um, of that initiative, uh, it, it more or less came, came to naught, uh, which indicated that there was some sort of um, market failure going on, and I'll touch on this later on. In terms of the impacts of camel, feral camels as we understood them in 2008, well, well, as with all pest animal species, there are positive and negative impacts or aspects to impact. For the camel, there's certainly some positive aspects. They are an iconic species. They're certainly utilised in tourism uh, very widely throughout Australia. Um, there's that very rich historical perspective in respect to feral camels. And um, they're potentially an economic resource. And as I said, they have, uh, were being used for woody weed control. So certainly some pluses. But in terms of the negative impacts, Certainly some significant impacts at that time on co cultural and social values, particularly damage to infrastructure in remote Aboriginal communities um, and also to important cultural sites. And that lower image there is uh, camels impacting on a, an important um, wetland. Negative impacts uh, from a commercial perspective. Certainly camels uh, damage infrastructure on pastoral leases. 
Um, and we ascertain that the value of the impact um, as well as potential competition with stock um, may have been as high as seven, over $7 million annually back in 2008. And certainly some environmental impacts were quite apparent. Um, impacts on woody vegetation because camels are primarily browsers. The image on the top right over there is a Kwandong plant, which is one of the ice cream species for camels. And uh, camels actually have the ability combined with fire impacts to actually drive this uh, species uh, to a regional extinction, uh, we believe. And impacts once again on important wetlands uh, dotted throughout the arid lands. And a couple of, a couple of those lower um, images there illustrate that. Interestingly, when we were doing this research, um, in 2007, there was a large-scale invasion of feral camels uh, of both pastoral leases and Aboriginal communities in search of water. Um, and this was probably one of the first indications that feral camels uh, had reached a population density in some areas where they were actually being stressed in terms of uh, resource availability. One thing we were able to do with uh, looking at camel impacts on pastoral leases in particular was uh, look at how the level of damage to infrastructure change with camel density. And you can see from this graph that as camel density increases, the level of impact also increases. Um, that's to be expected. But one of the important or key things from this graph here is that if you look um, over to the left, um, at around a density of 0.1 to 0.2 camels per square kilometre, the level of impact is relatively low and that give us, gave us some insights as to where you might want to aim your camel management in terms of camel density to minimise impacts. In terms of management options, <coughs> there were certainly some options out there that were available at the time and being used, um, particularly um, the humane destruction of camels or culling which was either occurring out of helicopters or from uh, on the ground. There was uh, a limited commercial harvest of camels, as I mentioned earlier, but there were, uh, it was limited and uh, there were issues in respect of uh, uh, market failure to do with the supply chain and uh, other things at that time. Exclusion was being applied in terms of keeping camels out of areas, uh, but uh, at the time, uh, as it is today, there's, that has fairly limited application. There were a range of techniques out there too which potentially could be used to manage camels, which we looked at. Um, but they weren't being used for one reason or another. Um, and th I mean, th things like uh, using toxins to poison camels and so on. Um, by and large, these options uh, weren't available and uh, they wouldn't be available without considerable research um, and, and development periods. Fertility control is often talked about as a mechanism for managing camels, but for a large, long-lived species with a relatively low reproductive rate, Fertility, fertility control is not really a good option for camels. So at the end of uh, the 2000, uh, 2008, at the conclusion of the project, um, the problem as we defined it then was camels distributed over a very large area. They are very mobile animals which poses a challenge for management. The po camel population uh, was certainly increasing. Camels have undesirable impacts on a range of uh, values above a density of about 0.1 to 0.2 camels per square kilometre. Um, camel density over a large proportion of the range was above what we would consider tolerable in terms of impacts. Um, landowners certainly had varying views on how camels should be managed. Um, and I've already mentioned the, um, the limited application of commercial um, harvest and use of camels due to um, perceived market failure at that time. So in terms of the key management rec recommendations that come out of the project, they were to manage to a long-term target density of 0.1 to 0.2 per square kilometre to mitigate impacts, to incorporate key assets into our priority setting for camel management, certainly a need for a cross-jurisdictional and collaborative approach to management, we recommended a zoned approach, taking into account uh, landhold perceptions and views on management as well as uh, camel density. And importantly, look at the issues which were actually stymieing development of the, uh, the commercial camel industry. Thank you.